Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Billingsley. I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to uh, our fifth installment of the 125th anniversary virtual education series. Um, before I go any further, I'm going to go off script for just a moment. Um, I want to ask that we all keep our fallen and injured American soldiers in Afghanistan, as well as their families here at home, in our hearts tonight. Today was a devastating day in Kabul. Um, so I just, I just thought that we should all think about that even as we do this. Um, my name is Scott Billingsley. Um, I represent uh, the GEMS board, uh, the uh, graduates of Earth and Mineral Sciences. Uh, uh, we're an alumni board that works with students, uh, faculty, and other alumni. Um, we are presenting this uh, 125th uh, presentation uh, in conjunction with the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. Um, and uh, the, the two groups have put together a series or putting together a series of talks um, through the summer and into the fall and on into next year of different activities that top scientists and researchers and students and uh, other professors at, at the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences have done uh, and are doing right now to enhance uh, all of our lives and our knowledge of the world around us. Um, I come from uh, Meadville, Pennsylvania. I was from the class of 1981 in geosciences. Uh, I worked 40 years in the oil and gas business, both unconventional and conventional in the Appalachian Basin. I retired recently, uh, last November. And um, so now I'm uh, uh, putting a lot more time into volunteering at Penn State. I am now president-elect of the GEMS board and plan to be with uh, the GEMS group for quite some time. So in, uh, uh, in all uh, fairness, I would like to spend the time uh, talking about our uh, speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. James Casting. He's the Evan Pugh University Professor of Geosciences with a joint appointment in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science. Um, Dr. Casting earned an undergraduate degree in chemistry and physics from Harvard University in 1975 and a PhD in atmospheric sciences from the University of Michigan in 1979. Prior to coming to Penn State in 1988, he spent two years at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and seven years in the uh, Space Science Division at NASA Ames Research Center south of San Francisco. His research focuses on the evolution of planetary atmospheres and climates and on the question of whether life might exist on planets around the stars, around other stars. In 2018, he was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. His popular book, How to Find a Habitable Planet, uh, was published in 2010. Um, I have a little little excerpt from, from his, uh, his talk tonight. Astronomers have discovered thousands of exoplanets orbiting nearby and not so nearby stars, but we still know very little about whether any of these planets might be habitable or whether any of them actually support life. Dr. Casting will present what we know now and what we hope to find in the future regarding this uh, topic, habitable zones in the search for life on planets around other stars. Uh, Dr. Casting, I'll leave it to you. Okay, thank you, Scott. And let me just echo what you said at the outset. You know, I would watch the news a little bit before signing on to this uh, webinar this evening, and it's really tragic over there in Kabul. So I'm going to talk about fun stuff tonight, but I sort of feel bad doing it because it was not a happy day for America or for Afghanistan. Let me uh, share my slides if I can. All right. Does that look good, Scott? Yes, it does. Okay. So this is one of this series that I've only learned about by being invited to speak, but I'm really delighted to get a chance to address the uh, EMS alumni. Oh. So let me start out. The, the talk title, as Scott said, is Habitable Zones and the Search for Life on Planets Around Other Stars. That sounds more like astronomy, doesn't it? Uh, so I, 
as Scott mentioned, I'm in, I have a joint appointment in geosciences and in meteorology and atmospheric sciences, but actually as we get, as exoplanets have been discovered and as particularly as we start to get observations of them, astronomy and geosciences and atmospheric sciences are all being drawn together. So let's start with what we know. We, we know now that planets exist around most stars in the galaxy. I'll show you how we know in a moment. Some of these planets may be habitable like the Earth. We don't know that for a fact, but it's, uh, people have speculated for a long time that that could be the case. And then the interesting part to me is that technology has advanced to the point where we don't just need to speculate about this anymore. We can actually build telescopes that will maybe tell us the answer. And I'm gonna that, actually spend most of my time talking about that because uh, real observations will be more interesting than pure speculation. All right, how do we know about extrasolar planets? Uh, some of you may know that the first exoplanets are extrasolar planets, planets around other stars. The first exoplanets were discovered in, uh, 30 years ago by Penn State radio astronomer Alex Wolskan. And he was operating a radio telescope and uh, looking at a pulsar, which is a spinning neutron star. And then he monitored the Doppler shift there and found evidence for two, later three planets. But those planets, they were the first ones discovered. So Alex is famous among, amongst astronomers for that but they're not likely to be habitable because the area around a pulsar is really bad. It's almost as bad as the area around a black hole, which was the focus of the movie Interstellar. And the crew curiously chose to go there instead of to a planet around a normal star. Ex exoplanets orbiting normal main sequence stars. A main sequence star is one like the sun that's fusing hydrogen in its core. Uh, were discovered five years later using what the astronomers call the radial velocity method or, or the Doppler method. You're looking for, for the wiggle of the star back and forth in your line of sight as the planet goes around it, because the, the star, of course, pulls on the planet by gravity, but the planet pulls on the star. And so if there's a component of that motion in your line of sight, you can measure the Doppler effect. We, we, our astronomy department is now very good at that. We have two of the world's experts, Jason Wright and Suvrat Mahadevan, who both work on RV measurements and they're, they're highly respected for that. Most of the exoplanets though were not discovered by that method. They were discovered later by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, which you can see a picture of over here at the right. It did its main mission from 2009 to 2013 it's a one meter telescope, one meter diameter telescope, which is smaller than the Hubble. Hubble is 2.4 meters, but it has special purpose. It stared at this patch of the Milky Way. If you see where my uh, pointer is, is pointing here, it stared at this patch for four years straight, just off the plane of the Milky Way. And it monitored the brightnesses of 160,000 stars simultaneously, which is a real feat. But then, if you have planets that transit their star, they pass in front of it uh, as they orbit, then the star dims by a little bit as the uh, planet goes in front. And so uh, that's called the transit method. And uh, as I said, thousands of planets now have been discovered, thousands of exoplanets have been discovered from the Kepler data set. All right, well, on to habitable planets. Uh, we don't really know whether any of those thousands of planets are habitable we do have some ideas about what they would need. First of all, the planet needs to have a solid or a liquid surface. Uh, in other words, no gas giants. Uh, we have four gas giants in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. None of those, you know, they, they go, they grade continuously from the thin upper atmosphere to the dense interior, so that there's really no place for life to get started on a planet like that. And almost everybody in the field agrees with that. You need a, a thermodynamic free energy gradient to power metabolism. Organisms need energy to live. And if they're at the surface of the planet, they can use sunlight. So there's, there's other ways to power organisms, but all biologists agree that you need that. 
uh, life on Earth is made of carbon, so you need, uh, and there's good reasons to think that life elsewhere would be primarily made of carbon too, and probably with other elements that we see in Earth life. Uh, this is sometimes called schnapps uh, by the astrobiologists, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen phosphorus, and sulfur. And then finally, uh, Earth life requires liquid water. Not all the time. There are organisms that form spores, for instance, that can get by without water for long time periods. But in order to metabolize and reproduce, they need liquid water. And then we're sp specifically, the astronomers are specifically interested in planets that have liquid water at their surfaces because they want that life to be present at the surface of a planet in such a way that it can modify the planet planet's atmosphere and, and so that they can observe it. So this leads directly into the concept of the habitable zone around stars, uh, which is something that I've worked on. And this is where geosciences and meteorology meet up with astronomy. Uh, the habitable zone is an old, old concept. It's been around for a long time, but that is defined as the region around a star where a planet can maintain liquid water at its surface. And so here's a, a rather old diagram of the habitable zone based on some calculations that our group published almost 30 years ago. The horizontal x-axis is the distance from the star in astronomical units. Some Europeans actually made this slide. So 0, 0,1 is 0 0.1, uh, 0.1 astronomical units. The Earth, of course, is at one astronomical unit because that's the definition of an astronomical unit. Here's the Earth, we're the third rock from the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Mars is just outside the habitable zone in this diagram. And on the vertical scale is the mass of the star relative to the mass of the sun. The sun is this yellow star in the middle here. And as stars that are more massive get bluer or whiter and um, more, more luminous, so the habitable zone moves away, stars that are dimmer than the sun, particularly these red dwarfs down here at the bottom are much less luminous. So, so to be habitable at the surface, the, the planet must be much closer to the star, right? It's, this habitable zone moves as stars age because all stars uh, get brighter as they age. It's because they're converting hydrogen to helium in their cores, the cores become denser, they collapse and heat up and that makes the fusion reactions go faster. So as you see here, this is, this is a, what's called a zero age main sequence habitable zone. It's the habitable zone when the sun first became a, a hydrogen burning star about 4.6 billion years ago. And at that point, the earth was sitting right in the middle of the habitable zone. Now, the, as, as I said, geoscience has things to say on this. How wide is the habitable zone? People have speculated on that for 30 or 40 years. And there was a planetary scientist at NASA Goddard named Michael Hart, who wrote some papers back in the late 1970s arguing that the habitable zone was narrow. But I, I was a graduate student at that time, and that got me motivated to study this. And we now think, most of us think, that the habitable zone is wide, and it's because of feedbacks in the carbon cycle. And you, you may know if there's a lot of news these days about the greenhouse effect. The earth is warmed by greenhouse gases, predominantly water vapor and carbon dioxide. And that's a, it's a big issue today because CO2 has been going up and we call that global warming. But in general, the greenhouse effect is a good thing because without the, without the greenhouse effect of CO2 and water, the earth would be frozen. Uh, the, the carbon cycle controls the CO2 level of the atmosphere, and I don't, I can answer questions about it, if, uh, but I don't want to take too much time. There's different parts of the carbon cycle. There's the organic carbon cycle, which is photosynthesis in one direction and respiration and decay in the other. And then there's the inorganic carbon cycle or carbonate silicate cycle, which is shown on this diagram right here. And that's what we think controls Earth's climate over long time scales. So briefly, the CO2 dissolves in rainwater to give carbonic acid that weathers uh, silicate rocks on the land and carbonates, but it's the silicates that matter here and releases calcium and magnesium ions and bicarbonate 
into solution and those ions flow down into the ocean where organisms make shells out of calcium carbonate. Some of that gets buried in sediments and then the, the seafloor isn't just sitting there, right? The geologists know that the seafloor is spreading. That's part of plate tectonics. In some areas, the seafloor is subducted, the carbonate sediments are heated up and CO2 is released and goes back into the atmosphere. And if you think about this, the, the weathering part of the cycle, which, uh, is, which is the loss process, process for CO2, depends on temperature. If the earth gets too cold, weathering slows down, so CO2 builds up. If the earth gets too hot, weathering accelerates, so CO2 goes down. That's part of the theory that I've worked on for on and off for a long time. So that's why we think the habitable zone is relatively wide. All right, if you accept that, uh, here's a more recent view of the habitable zone. This is, I had a graduate student a few years ago, Sonny Harmon, who was a good graphics artist. And so this is a plot that he made just recently, which shows the habitable zone around different stars, but the axes are a little bit different now. Instead of showing distance on the x-axis, this graph shows the amount of starlight relative to the sunlight on Earth. So 100% is right here, that's where the Earth is. You can see Venus over here on the left and Mars is somewhere over on the right blocked by my Zoom screen right now. Uh, the, the vertical axis, instead of being stellar mass, it's stellar surface temperature or effective temperature, but that goes the same direction. The brighter stars are uh, hotter at the surface and the dim red dwarfs are cooler at the surface. The advantage of showing the habitable zone this way is that it, it expands the habitable zone so you can see it more clearly around different types of stars. We argue about whether we should use the conservative, conservative habitable zone or the optimistic one. I like the conservative habitable zone myself, which includes Earth and Mars, but not Venus today. Down here at the bottom, these are exoplanets that have been found, most of them from the Kepler Space Telescope that I mentioned earlier, some of them by ground-based transits. You may have heard of this system down here at the bottom, the TRAPPIST-1 system. That actually has eight planets that transit the star. The, 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 it's a dim red dwarf. Uh, three of those are in the conservative habitable zone. And then this one where my pointer is right now, that's Proxima Centauri b. You may recognize that that's a companion star of Alpha Centauri. Alpha, the Alpha Centauri system is a triple star. There's two, two sun-like stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri, and then a red dwarf, Proxima. They're all about four light years from the Earth. And so they're actually a, a promising target. And there, there is an Earth-like planet in the, hab, well, an Earth mass planet in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri, which is very interesting to the uh, astronomers. All right, then I promised I would tell you what the astronomers are planning to do. If you've been following the astronomy news, they, they're about to, NASA is about to launch a really big space telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. It was supposed to launch eight or nine years ago. It kept getting delayed and getting more expensive, but if everything goes well, it's going to launch in a, late October of this year. I think it's going through the Panama Canal right now. It was assembled on the West Coast and it's gonna launch from French Guiana, so launching near the equator. So I think it's being carried through the Panama Canal right now. This is a six and a half meter telescope. Remember the Hubble is 2.4 meters. So this is three times the diameter of the Hubble Space Telescope. It's really a gigantic instrument. And that, that will be able to, get spectra of transiting planets, planets that pass in front of their stars, in front of and behind their stars, like the TRAPPIST-1 system that, that was shown on the previous slide. So that, in fact, the TRAPPIST-1 planets are gonna be one of the prime targets for JWST when it goes up and we'll be very interested to see what they find. Uh, the astronomers are also building big telescopes on the ground. This is a, Artist's conception of one of them, the, the uh, European Southern Observatory's extremely large telescope, ELT, which is being built down in Chile in the Atacama Desert. That's where the Europeans do their observing because the 
observing conditions are much better than they are in Europe. Uh, this, this has a 39 meter mirror. The biggest ground-based telescopes in the world right now are the two Keck 10 meter telescopes in Hawaii. So this will be four times the diameter of the biggest existing telescopes. And this can, this telescope on paper at least should be able to get spectra of, of Proxima Centauri, which is that nearby red dwarf that has a Earth mass planet orbiting in its habitable zone. So that could happen within the next uh, five or six years. Uh, if we want to observe more planets, besides you know, just very special ones, we need what are called direct imaging telescopes. Instead of looking for transiting planets where you're, you're looking for a planet that goes in front of its star and then a little bit of the light from the star goes through the planet's atmosphere, these would look for reflected light from planets orbiting the star, but not going and passing in front of it. And so this would allow you to uh, allow us to look for planets around uh, all the nearby stars. Well, there's two, two ones that have been, uh, are being studied or have been studied by the astronomers, Louvoir, the large UV optical infrared space telescope up here at the top, and HabEx, the habitable planet explorer down here at the bottom. HabEx is four meters, and Louvoir is either eight or 15 meters. HabEx has a big star shade to help it block up. The hard part here is blocking out the starlight so you can see the dim light from the planet. Then my last data slide here, what can you hope to see? Well, here's a, uh, here's a you're only gonna get one pixel resolution. You can't get a spatially resolved image, but you can get a, a planet with one pixel spatial resolution, but you can get a pretty good spectrum from it. And so here's the Earth at one pixel resolution. This is it's called Earthshine, and the units, I apologize, the astronomers like angstroms, and angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. So the visible in these units goes from 4,000 to 7,000 angstroms. Uh, what they did to get this is they looked at the dark side of the moon from a tele little three and a half meter telescope in Kitt Peak out in Arizona. If you've ever looked at the moon, uh, when it's really dark you, and the moon's in crescent phase, you can see the bright crescent phase, that's reflected sunlight, of course, but the, you can also, if the sky is dark, you can see the dark side of the moon a little bit. Why is that? It's because that's sunlight that bounced off the earth, went to the moon, bounced off the moon, and then came back to the earth. And so if you take a spectrum of the dark side of the moon and subtract out the spectrum of the bright side of the moon, you can get a one pixel resolution uh, spectrum of the Earth. And I'll just point out down here that black curve are the data up here at the top. The uh, red curve down here in the bottom panel are a simulation of the data. This big broad absorption feature here in the mid visible is from ozone. O3, ozone is formed from O2, so that's an indicator of oxygen. And of course, most of our oxygen comes from photosynthesis. Oxygen has absorption bands itself. The, the A band here at 7,600 angstroms and the B band, which is a little weaker. And all, bo both of these big space telescopes would be designed to be able to look for those bands on other planets. You'd also like to see methane because the really best uh, biosignature, most of us think, is the simultaneous uh, existence of oxygen and methane, which is a reduced gas but that takes an even bigger telescope than these ones to see. So let me leave you with three, con four conclusions. We already know there's lots of exoplanets. A fair number of them may be habitable. We're speculating there, but that, you know, there's reasons to think so because the habitable zone is wide, at least I think we, we can get Within the near future, we can get the spectra of a few of these exoplanets from the James Webb Space Telescope and from these ground-based telescopes that are under construction. And then hopefully in the future, hopefully during my lifetime, while I'm still upright and not horizontal underneath the ground, we'll get these direct imaging missions like HabEx or Louvoir and be able to really carry out this search for life uh, in more detail. Okay, and so I'm going to leave this slide on, and I'm happy to take questions on, on what I just talked about. Scott, you're muted. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Casting. If uh, anyone has questions about the presentation, we have a Q&A button uh, down at the bottom, bottom of your screen that you can enter your questions and uh, we will then turn them over to Dr. Casting to, uh, uh, to go over for you. Um, we have one right here. Uh, from the geologic standpoint, what do we know about the endowment of uh, CHNOPS on these exoplanets? Right, so that's a, that's a good question. Observationally, we don't know too much, but we do know that other stars have mostly similar compositions to the sun. The astronomers talk about it in terms of metallicity. Uh, astronomers are not very, most of them are not very detailed chemists. To them, anything heavier than helium is a metal, right? So all these elements that we care about for life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, the astronomers would call, it, call metals. And if you look, they can determine how many, how many metals or the metal abundances in stars by taking spectra of the stars themselves. And as I said, most of them have roughly similar metallicities than uh, as our sun. So if the star has those elements, we think that the planets will have those elements as well. And there's a whole field of astronomy that is devoted to simulating that. So there's lots of theory there and not too many observations. Um, I have a question here. So if we're seeing light from objects that was emitted many millions of years ago, how do we know where the planet, the exoplanet might sit with respect to the star and the habitable uh, zone today? Well, remember, you know, one of the stars we're going to look at first is Proxima Centauri. That's only four light years away. So we're not talking about many millions of years. We're talking about four years ago, right? And in fact, all of the planets that even these big direct imaging telescopes can look at, almost all of them would be within about 50 light years from the Earth. So we're, you know, there are certainly stars in our, gal our galaxy that are tens of thousands of light years away, and there are stars in other galaxies that are many millions of light years away, but those are not the ones that we'll be looking for, at least not during any of our lifetimes. We're gonna look at the nearby stars, and so we're looking in recent time. Okay, here's one. I realize we need to put guardrails on the definition of habitable, but could there be other forms of life that don't follow the inorganic carbon cycle and presence of surface water? Okay, so that's a, <laughs> one of the prime questions for astrobiologists, right? And I, I focused on Earth-like life that requires liquid water because you know, I'm talking about astronomy here. And these, when you're looking at exoplanets, there's no way of getting ground truth, right? We can just get spectra. And I would argue that if, it's, if that life is not pretty much like us, we're, we're gonna have difficulty recognizing it. Now, if you, there's a lot of, actually most astrobiologists are focused on our own solar system. So they wanna know if there's life on Mars or some of them think there might be life on Saturn's moon Titan, which is, you know, doesn't have liquid water, but it has liquid methane oceans. And the good news is that uh, in our own solar system, technology has also made it possible for us to go there. In fact, there is a, a mission that is being designed right now called Dragonfly, which should fly in about seven or eight years. That's gonna fly a drone around in Titan's atmosphere. And we'll look, you know, look a little bit for evidence of life there. Uh, I mentioned Dragonfly in particular because Penn State is involved in that project. Two of the, two of our engineers over in the engineering college are designing the rotors for the drone that Dragonfly will will uh, fly. So, so, so you can t test that. You can answer your question or at least test it a little bit by looking elsewhere in our solar system for things that are not so much like us. This might be uh, tied to that. Uh, thinking, of, thinking about our own solar system, how does the concept of life on moons like Enceladus fit with the habitable zone concept? So Enceladus and Enceladus is a moon of Saturn and uh, Europa is a moon of Jupiter and those are also two prime targets for solar system astrobiologists, because we know that 
both of them have they have icy surfaces, but we know that they have a liquid ocean underneath, which is thought to be predominantly water, maybe with some other things mixed in. Enceladus, you, you may know, uh, has plumes uh, that are continuously going off, erupting from its South Pole region. And NASA had a, uh, an orbiter, Enceladus is orbiting Saturn, and NASA had the Cassini orbiter was out there in orbit for around Saturn for 11 years. It finally, they crashed it into Saturn about two or three years ago, I think it was, but it made multiple passes through Enceladus's plume, uh, trying to sample you know, what's coming out of there. And they did find organics. They, well, they found methane and hydrogen and other things. And so one of the missions that the astrobiologists really want to do is to go back to Enceladus and investigate the plume more carefully. Uh, eventually, they want to you know, drill through the ice, perhaps, and go sample the ocean and do the same thing on Europa. But those are, those are really difficult missions. They're sort of equal in complexity to these direct imaging telescopes that the astronomers are trying to develop. Uh, I have a question here. Are there any plans for a new Kepler-like telescope looking at another section of the sky? I, I'm a little out of date on this, but I think the Europeans are building one as we speak. I think it's called Plato. And uh, yes, that, it's been done once, but it, can, it should be done elsewhere. You know, you might, and there's another telescope that actually that NASA built called TESS that is up there doing this also. It's looking for transits. It's, it's during the active phase of its mission and it's surveying the entire sky, but it can't really find Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars because think about it. Uh, if, you, if you're looking at the sun from a distance and you wanna find the Earth, the Earth is, is only gonna pass in front of the sun once every, once every year, right? And you need at least three transits to identify the planet. You get one transit, that's a little blip. That could be a, a speck of dust out there in, in space. That could be some glitch in your instrument. If you get two glitches, then maybe you have a planet, but you don't really know. If you get three and they're equally spaced, now you start thinking you've got a planet. And of course, you'd like to have additional ones beyond that. So the reason Kepler didn't look all over the place was because it was, its mission was to find Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars. And that meant it had to have at least three or four years of data looking at the same systems to, to be able to do that. Now, TESS, TESS is looking all over the sky. It, 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 it doesn't you can't possibly find Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars because their orbits are too far away, but it can find Earth-sized planets around M stars, these red dwarfs where the habitable zone is close in and uh, the, the orbits are shorter, right? So TESS, TESS may find some additional uh, targets for JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, to look at. I have a question here. Is it likely to have non-tectonically active planets in the habitable zone? Okay, so now we're into geosciences again. <laughs> I've got a young colleague, uh, Brad Foley, in the geosciences department. He was hired just two, uh, three or four years ago now, I guess. He, he's interested in exoplanets, but he is he's also his real specialty is mantle convection and plate tectonics. And he's been writing papers on exactly that question that you asked. In fact, he argues in one of his recent papers that it's possible to stabilize the carbonate silicate cycle on a planet that doesn't have plate tectonics. Okay. Right? So if, if you're interested in that, just send me an email and I'll refer you to uh, one, this paper by Brad. What do you see as EMS's continued involvement and contribution to exoplanet research in the future? Okay, well, we, we have big plans, not just at the EMS level, but at the university level. Uh, a year and a half ago, the university launched uh, a consortium called the Consortium for Planetary and Exoplanetary Science and Technology, which has the unfortunate acronym of CPEST. Uh, but that, 
the, the, uh, the, this initiative involves EMS, but it also involves College of Science and it involves College of Engineering. And the, the thinking behind this is what, what I sort of alluded to at the beginning of my talk, that as the observations of planets around other stars improve, they need to know, the astronomers need to know more about planets and the, pla the, the, geo the planetary scientists need to know more about exoplanets and the engineers over in the engineering college need to build a spacecraft that can go explore the solar system and get big space telescopes out to uh, Lagrange points where they can do uh, space observations. So, so it's really, it's an exciting initiative. The only thing is it slowed down because CPEST was announced about the same time COVID was announced. And so uh, we're kind of on hold on hiring patterns, but, uh, but we hope to get that going again within the next year or two. Uh, here's a question. Wouldn't the planet's rotation and revolution around its star have, an, have a significant impact on whether or not it could be habitable as well, even if it fell within the HZ? So that is a, a great question. Uh, the, the habitable zone that I showed you were based on calculations with, that our group did with, with a one-dimensional model, so a globally averaged climate model. And if you, you know, follow climate modeling, you know that nobody does that for the modern Earth. They use three-dimensional GCMs, general global climate models. And so now the exoplanet Climatologists have been doing that too. They've been developing much more complicated three-dimensional models, and uh, and so they they you know they're refining the habitable zone as we speak. Uh, planets around M stars. One one of the things that I didn't mention, but remember the M stars are the red dwarfs. The habitable zone is really close in, and so you can show that most of those planets are probably tidally locked and maybe synchronously rotating. So what does that mean? The moon is synchronously rotating around the earth. It always shows the same face to the earth as it goes around, right? It wobbles or librates just a little bit in its orbit, but it, it's not, it's spinning once per orbit because it's, its spin rate was captured by the earth. Same thing is expected to happen to a planet around and it's in the habitable zone of an M star it's going to have a sunlit, permanently sunlit side and a permanently dark side. And those planets behave climatically quite differently from rapidly rotating planets like the Earth. In fact, some models predict that the habitable zone can be much closer to the star in that case. That's, I, I showed you that optimistic habitable zone. So if you're an optimist and you think those planets are tidally locked, uh, some of those M star planets could have liquid water. I have one here. Uh, so if the James Webb Space Telescope will be viewing, as you just said, exoplanets uh, in the, uh, with M stars that are unlikely to fit the HZ model, why are we looking at them? Astronomers like to look at anything they can see, right? So you don't have to have a habitable planet or life in order to get an astronomer excited, He right? They, anything they can observe out there, they do observe. They're, they're, they're excellent observationalists and instrument, excellent instrument builders. So the reason they're excited about M stars right now is because they're easier to see. You can, you can get spectra of their atmospheres through transits. So you can do it with the James Webb Space Telescope. You don't have to build these even bigger and more expensive direct imaging telescopes. Right, so it's just a matter of practicality. Well, I think we've walked through all the questions we have. Is there any anyone else out there who has a question for Dr. Casting? My assistant says there's one more coming. Is, is the zone in which life could survive different from the zone in which it could initially develop? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> it's in, fact, it <laughs> in fact, there is a new paper coming out in Nature in about uh, two or three weeks, which is basically on that question 
I'm writing the news and views piece for it, and I can't talk about it uh, because, of course, it's embargoed. But that is a very good question. So look, look at nature about uh, three weeks from now. OK. I think we, no more questions. I think we've reached the end. Well, Dr. Casting, I really appreciate your, your talk. This has been very exciting, very interesting stuff. I mean, I, I know from discussing this with you before the meeting that you are a Star Trek fan, so you do have the, uh, the interest in what might be out there just besides the planets themselves. Yeah, well, you know, one of my colleagues up at MIT, Sarah Seeger, who's actually, she's uh, a young, very bright, and, and pretty famous uh, exoplanet astronomer. She, she describes what's happening now as the second Copernican revolution. So the first one, of course, Copernicus is credited with figuring out that the Earth went around the sun rather than vice versa. And Sarah says that when we find another Earth out there and discover whether or not it has life, that's, that's the equivalent of the Copernican revolution. So I, I kind of like that, that thought. Well, thank you so much. Um, the screen that's showing right now uh, are basically for uh, those of you who are watching this. Uh, it's a, a note to stay connected with uh, the College of, your, of Earth and Mineral Sciences in your department and our uh, GEMS board. We're always looking for interested people. Um, and uh, Jim, if you'd switch to the next slide, the last slide. We would like your feedback. Um, if you have any topics or research areas that you would like us to look into for future presentations, um, let us know. Uh, go to the gems at ems.psu.edu and uh, email us. And if you have any ideas, we would be more than happy to take them and look, look, them, look them up and uh, see if we can find an expert like we did with uh, Dr. Casting here today and uh, see what we can do. Uh, I think that's all from my end, uh, Jim, unless you have anything else to add. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's always fun to talk about this subject. Well, thank you and uh, thank all of our participants and the audience. Uh, and I think we'll see you in uh, two months, another month and uh, two months from now, we're gonna do this one more time. So take care all. Bye-bye. Bye.